It is Wednesday, December 13th, 2017. It is 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and so you know what time it is. It's time for a little bit of coin metal. And what an interesting day it has been. I, I, I can't tell you how much I've lost as far as like time today, just getting stuck in the Twitter sphere and all that other bullshit. But I finally got a, a big step of some of my work completed. It was, uh, it was a long time coming. And uh, I, I'm very happy that, uh, that, I, that I got there. Hopefully I can move on with other shit now. But, you know, as far as like the markets go today, can you believe what's been going on out there? All kinds of action on the old Ripple. Just a little bit of funk on the old, uh, the old XVG. Gotta love it. Definitely a lot of guys taking a second look at it after that spike today. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it's been lively. There's a lot of uh, a lot of stalling. It seems you know there's it seems like there's a lot of sideways movement as far as how should I say this? Like the the intransigence of certain parties to make certain adoptions one way or another um, is kind of keeping everybody in a holding pattern. I think as far as Bitcoin is concerned, and you know. I don't know if it's intentional or what, but it, what it seems to me to be doing is providing all kinds of opportunity for other cryptocurrencies to shine through and really show what they've got. And I can't help but think this, uh, this will definitely lead to good things for smaller coins such as Verge, especially now when, when people are looking for the cheapest avenues for moving their monetary value around. And, you know, with regard to the regulation front, we're definitely going to be touching on some of that today. I've got this article, and it's it's just so clickbaitingly good, I had to open it. I don't know what it actually says, um, because I haven't read it, um, but this is uh, supposedly on bitcoin-newswire.com, whatever the fuck that is. Um, and we'll, we'll touch on it first thing after the uh, music break but yeah unfortunately uh, unfortunately I didn't actually get to get my ass kicked at jiu-jitsu today I'm, I'm a little bit off the rails with regard to my training at the moment however I do expect that to be changing in the very very short term um, as a matter of fact I, it was funny I, I was uh, I was very put off because of my inabilities to move some monetary value around recently. Um, but it turns out that the not having been able to do that transaction when I wanted to do it um, has actually done me a solid. Um, I'm up about 300 bucks on my dash. <laughs> it's like, I, 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 you gotta love it. It's fucking crypto life. You know, you get bogarted at one end, you got fucking Delta Solid on the other. <sighs> so, we can't bitch too much anymore. Anyway, I, I still don't know what the fuck I'm going to do with regard to that. I'm sure that uh, in the in the not-so-distant future, and I mean like really, really, really soon, as a matter of fact, I had a story to this effect recently, and I, I might have to dig it back up again and see if we can uh, flesh it out for the... Uh, for the show, but it seems like there are more and more options to go straight from crypto to debit cards. Now, th this development <clears throat> it opens up the uh, the opportunity for a lot of abuse, but I think anyway, you know, because you've got a third party intermediary in there. However. As long as the transaction clears, that's the smell test for me. I don't give a fuck about certifications. I don't give a fuck about state or federal stamps of approval. I, I don't care about, you know, security audits by external sources. I don't care about any of these fucking things. Does the transaction go through? Can I move monetary value from one person to another without the need for a third party intermediary or overly burdensome cruft to enable that to happen. 
And so far, it seems to me that Bitcoin is kind of starting to lag down behind that uh, that threshold. And it, you know what? I want to tell you all, it, nothing, nothing pains me more than saying that. Because this, I've read the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper on this show three times since I started doing this show. I, start, I, I did live reads of the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper three times as a matter of fact if you go up on my uh, on my YouTube channel you can find them there um, I don't know if I actually have one marked as the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper if I don't I'm gonna go back through my own archives and see if I've got it loaded up to like <clears throat> mix mix cloud or SoundCloud or one of those other cloud clouds um, and because uh, I, I had active accounts on all of these social media venues when I first started but the point being that I've read it a lot on this show I love Bitcoin okay it's it's what brought me here it's what keeps me here and, and it's not the the promise of future riches or even immediate riches that keeps me here it's the fact that I hold my riches you know and I can hold them in any way I want in a, a number of ways that are as of yet uh, untraceable and non-custodial in, in that they are not held by a third party on my behalf. So, you know, I don't have a significant sum held in such way. I wish that weren't true. But, you know, things are what they are. We are where we are for doing what we've done. You know, and I, I've already mentioned before on this show, I'm not exactly the best trader in crypto but I do know scam coins when I see scam coins and that saved me a lot of money so you know that that's to be something to be credited for my experience and so when you hear me call out scam coins on here or what I think are, are possibly scam coins um, you should probably listen. It's not because I'm some fucking economist expert or or I'm some you know cryptography expert or I, I'm some social networking expert or any of that other bullshit. It's because I've read through enough fucking white papers and seen the performance of enough projects for enough time for enough time that I've been able to kind of disseminate some aspects of coins that are potentials for abuse and outright scammeries and I mean, let me tell you man it, it never it never ends as far as like the the depth of craziness people will jump to in order in order to try and make money I mean what was the last one here crypto kittens I, I didn't even bother I you know I didn't google it I didn't I didn't hunt for it on my Twitter feed not even interested. I don't care if you made money on it. Big fucking whoop de do. You know, I mean, you might as well be playing. You might as well go to Vegas if that's your idea of investing in and in, in uh, cryptocurrencies. You, you might as well be in Vegas. You might as well be, uh, you know, on a, on a, uh, a blackjack table or some shit like that. You got about as much chance of of walking away in the green or in the black. You know. And, and and what's worse is, you know, a lot of people are, are like willingly getting into these things, you know, knowing that they are the the scam coin radar is just fucking emblazing fucking day glow pink in every every sector of your vision. But no, it looks like it looks like we might make some money there. Maybe before it can collapse, you know, we we know we know the potential is is looming so far uh, so heavily above our shoulder. It, it might as well be a Death Star rising over the horizon of your of your planet in the in the night sky, man. I mean, you know, but no, we might be able to get off world before it fires. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, dude. It's a big gun. If it's with invisible range, you're dead. <laughs> the, the likelihood is that somebody else is going to be walking away with your coins. 
And, and it doesn't even matter if it's on a, a regulated exchange or it's got all the KYC, CYA bullshit. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Look, look out there in the legacy markets. Why do you think people are so desperate to get here? It's because we've got a slightly higher stank of legitimacy than Wall Street. Can you imagine? We're talking about an institution that's been around for... Uh, in some iteration or another for about the last three centuries and and people are so desperate to escape it and their own national currencies that they're jumping to cryptocurrencies, virtual currencies that were created by people no older than their own children that's called desperation folks, but check this out that's how far the low, the the fucking low, the bar of credibility has descended to. That a fourteen-year-old can crank out a cryptocurrency, dump it on the market, and people look at it and say, "You know what? This looks like a pretty solid project. I'm gonna throw some money at it." The old metrics, the old values, these things are gone. We're still. I mean, when I talk to people on the on the internet about these things, we're all still reaching out into the dark. You know, I have my own impressions of what I think Segregated Witness and Lightning Network are all about. And you know what, though? I, I base my opinions off of what I'm reading. You know, as far as like their own materials, their and watching their the the people from I'm I'm supposing they were from Blockstream. I don't know, but somebody describing in technical detail the functionality of what they're trying to do with Lightning Network and it's kind of obvious to me that it, it that there are frameworks already in place to regulate what these people are talking about I know nobody wants to believe that and just because the feds haven't kicked down your fucking door and confiscated all your hardware and, and, and you know, taking you to Guantanamo until you've given up where you've got accounts at. You know, all of these things, just because that hasn't happened doesn't mean that there isn't some potential in the future. <laughs> anyway, I'm rambling. Let's get back into, let's throw down into some first music. Jeez, we, I, I just like launched, man. <sighs> And as far as what to what to put down, I, I haven't even I haven't even thought about it. But you know what? I'm high energy right now, and so let's just go with it. And so Nightbringers, the Block Dahlia murder. Let's roll with it here. Nightbringers, first dance here on Coin Metal. And that was Hook and Mouth by Megadeth. Boy. And so, we do have this supposedly Wonder Bud article here on BTC News. This is quote unquote breaking news about Bitcoin. And never mind. It was September 17th, 2017. So, in other words, it was old shit. I, I, I it was clickbaity as fuck. Sorry. You know, I, I had to click on it because, you know, it's hot. It happens. We all get sucked in. We're all excited. Anyway, um, <laughs> I do have this other, um, other thing I wanted to touch on today. And, um, this one seems kind of pertinent, but the last, the last song that we listened to, it, it really kind of, um, really kind of got me thinking there has been this big push big 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 push to get people to forget exactly why people started getting into Bitcoin to begin with and I I can only imagine it's because then it makes it a little bit easier to change exactly what the um, the intent of Bitcoin was, you know, if you, if you believe that the intent of Bitcoin was to have a global settlement layer that a whole bunch of, or only actually a handful of vendors that can actually afford the regulatory friction and the BTC volumes 
required in order to maintain things like Lightning Node services. Um, you know, I, I, it just it disappoints me to talk to people who think that transaction fees over a dollar that's normal. You know, that's that that's something that we can tolerate. Why not? We we've been getting our asses fucked by our, our you know our credit cards and our debit cards this whole time. You know what, what what's a, what's a five dollar transaction fee? Hmm. How about a how about a ten dollar transaction fee? What about a fifteen dollar transaction fee? I mean, you didn't you didn't object to uh, either of the smaller numbers. So how about a fifteen dollar transaction fee for something that cost about 0.15 cents and it's it was entirely optional not four or five years ago now it's not that the uh, the network itself has uh, has shrunk too much it's it's narrowed in diversity of, of locations but that's been due to economic drivers caused by a constraint that some believe we just absolutely must maintain and at this point I believe it's a choke point for for uh, Bitcoin because they're attempting to force everybody to do their transactions off-chain this eliminates so much of what was Bitcoin or what Bitcoin was originally intended to be that like Roger Veer, I've got to wonder if you, we can even even call it Bitcoin, because honestly, I don't I don't feel like it matches up at all with this white paper. And there have been some that have wanted to go through and actually change the white paper so that it doesn't say what it says and says what they want it to say. That's because in the future they don't want you to be able to go back and look at it and read it and say, "Hey, wait a minute." This isn't anything like what we call Bitcoin today. I'm getting my ass raped all the time by these third-party intermediaries that were never even necessary in this system to begin with. But here's the thing. This white paper, it's not just here in, in front of me. You know, I, I've got it open on a tab on my browser. And it's not just on the internet. It's in many places. I would imagine it's probably in paper format at some in some location or another so getting rid of it before the financial issues that I see coming enveloping the entirety of the global economy I don't see it as being very likely and I, I've said on this show that I expect that in another decade no matter what happens between here and there, we will be right back where we are today, where we have public miners, people like you and me, don't require licenses to do what they're doing. And, and I'm not saying this so confidently because, you know, it's, it's some imaginary thing. You see, if you take Bitcoin off of its rails too far, it no longer will operate as Bitcoin. And, and in some aspects, it's already not operating like Bitcoin. But we're going to read this thing. And I, I will warn you right now, I'm not going to read through the math. I, I just, I need to do like a, a refresher course in college where uh, I relearn how to, <clears throat> how to read the maths in an Englishable form. Anyway, here we go. Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system by Satoshi Nakamoto, Bitcoin.org, Satoshi at GMX.com. That was actually out of order. My apologies for that. Abstract, a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. Digital signatures provide part of the solution, but the main benefits are lost if a trusted third party 
is still required to prevent double spending. We propose a solution to the double spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer network. The network timestamps transactions by hashing them into an ongoing chain of hash-based proof-of-work, forming a record that cannot be changed without redoing the proof-of-work. The longest chain not only serves as a proof of the sequence of events witnessed, but proof that it came from the largest pool of CPU power. As long as the majority of CPU power is controlled by nodes that are not cooper cooperating to attack the network, they'll generate the longest chain and outpace attackers. The network itself requires minimal structure. Messages are broadcast on a best effort basis, and nodes can leave and rejoin the network at will accepting the longest proof-of-work chain as proof of what happened while they were gone. Introduction Commerce on the Internet has come to rely almost exclusively on financial institutions serving as trusted third parties to process electronic payments. While the system works well enough for most transactions, it still suffers from the inherent weaknesses of the trust-based model. Completely non-reversible transactions are not really possible since financial institutions cannot avoid mediating disputes. The cost of mediation increases transaction costs, limiting the minimum practical transaction size and cutting off the possibility for small casual transactions and there is a broader cost in the loss of ability to make non-reversible payments for non-reversible services. With the possibility of reversal, the need for trust spreads. Merchants must be wary of their customers, hassling them for more information than they would otherwise need. A certain percentage of fraud is accepted as unavoidable. These costs and payment uncertainties can be avoided in person by using physical currency, but no mechanism exists to make payments over a communications channel without a trusted party. What is needed is an electronic payment system based on cryptographic proof instead of trust, allowing any two willing parties to transact directly with each other without the need for a trusted third party. Transactions that are computationally impractical to reverse would protect sellers from fraud and routine escrow mechanisms could easily be implemented to protect buyers. In this paper, we propose a solution to the double spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer distributed timestamp server to generate computational proof of the chronological order of transactions. The system is secure as long as honest nodes collectively control more CPU power than any cooperating group of attacker nodes. 2. Transactions We define an electronic coin as a chain of digital signatures. Each owner transfers the coin to the next by digitally signing a hash of the previous transaction and the public key of the next owner, and adding these to the end of the coin. A payee can verify the signatures to verify the chain of ownership. Let's see, here we go. Um, owner's, owner one's key, uh, one, owner one's public key goes to a hash and plus, plus owner zero signature and that verifies on the next transaction and the owner's first private key is also verified on my next transaction. And it, it just it gives us a nice little diagram of how the chain of events is supposed to be logged. We define electronic coin, blah, 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 blah. A payee can thus verify the signatures to verify the chain of ownership. 
The problem, of course, is the payee can't verify that one of the owners did not double spend the coin. A common solution is to introduce a trusted central authority or mint that checks every transaction for double spending. After each transaction, the coin must be returned to the mint to issue a new coin, and only coins issued directly from the mint are trusted not to be double spent. The problem with, the, with this solution is that the fate of the entire money system depends on the company running the mint, with every transaction having to go through them, just like a bank. We need a way for the payee to know that the previous owners did not sign any earlier transactions. For this purpose, for these, for our purposes, the earliest transaction is the one that counts, so we don't care about later attempts to double spend. The only way to confirm the absence of a transaction is to be aware of all transactions. In the Mint-based model, the Mint was aware of all transactions and decided which arrived first. To accomplish this without a trusted party, transactions must be publicly announced. We need a system for participants to agree on a single history of the order in which they were received. The payee needs proof at the time of each transaction the majority of nodes agreed it was the first received. 3. Timestamp Server The solution we propose begins with a timestamp server. A timestamp server works by taking a hash of a block of items to be timestamped and widely, widely publish, publishing the hash, such as in a newspaper or Usenet post. The timestamp proves that the data must have existed at the time, obviously, in order to get into the hash. Each timestamp includes the previous timestamp in its hash, forming a chain with each additional timestamp reinforcing the ones before it. Proof of work. This is number four, and we're on uh, page three of nine. To implement a distributed timestamp server on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, we will need to use a proof of work system similar to Adam Back's Hashcash, rather than newspaper or Usenet posts. Let's see. The proof of work involves scanning for a value that when hashed, such as with SHA-256, the hash begins with a number of zero bits. The average work required is exponential in the number of zero bits required and can be verified by executing a single hash. For our timestamp network, we implement the proof of work by incrementing, an, uh, incrementing a nonce in the block until a value is found that gives the block hash the required zero bits. Once the CPU effort has been expended to make it satisfy the proof of work, the block cannot be changed without redoing the work. As later blocks are chained after it, the work to change the block would include redoing all of the, all of the blocks after it. The proof of work also solves the problem of determining representation in majority decision making. If the majority were based on one IP address one vote, it could be subverted by anyone able to allocate many IPs. Proof of work is essentially one CPU one vote. The majority of decision is represented by the longest I'm sorry, the majority decision is represented by the longest chain, which has the greatest proof of work effort invested in it. If a majority of CPU power is controlled by honest nodes, the honest chain will grow the fastest and outpace any competing chains. To modify a pass block, an attacker would have to redo the proof of work of the block and all blocks after it, and then catch up and surpass the work of the honest nodes. We will show later that the probability of a slower attacker catching up diminishes exponentially as these subsequent blocks are added. 
To compensate for increasing hardware speed and varying interest in running nodes over time, the proof of work difficulty is determined by moving average targeting an average number of blocks per hour. If they're generated too fast, the difficulty increases. 5. Network These steps to run the network are as follows. Number 1. New transactions are broadcast to all nodes. Number 2. Each node collects new transactions into a block. Number 3. Each node works on finding a difficult proof of work for its block. Number 4. When a node finds a proof of work, it broadcasts the block to all nodes. 5. Nodes accept the block only if all transactions in it are valid and not already spent. 6. Nodes express their acceptance of the block by working on creating the next block in the chain using the hash of the accepted block as the previous hash. Nodes always consider the longest chain to be the correct one and will keep working on extending it. If two nodes broadcast different versions of the next block simultaneously, some nodes may receive one or the other first. In that case, they work on the first one they received but save the other branch in case it becomes longer. The tie will be broken when the next proof of work is found and one branch becomes longer. The nodes that were working on the other branch will then switch to the longer one. That was the end of page 3. New transaction broadcasts do not necessarily need to reach all nodes. As long as they reach many nodes, they will get into a block before long. Block broadcasts are also tolerant of dropped messages. If a node does not receive a block, it will request it, it will request it when it receives the next block and realizes it missed one. 6. Incentives By convention, the first transaction in a block is a special transaction that starts a new coin owned by the creator of the block. This adds an incentive for nodes to support the network and provides a way to initially distribute coins into circulation. Since there is no central authority to issue them, the steady addition of a constant amount of new coins is analogous to gold miners expending resources to add gold to circulation. In our case, it is CPU time and electricity that is expended. The incentive can also be funded with transaction fees. If the output value of the transaction is less than its input value, the difference is a transaction fee that is added to the incentive value of the block containing the transactions. Once a predetermined number of coins have entered circulation, the incentive can transition entirely to transaction fees and be completely inflation free. The incentive may help encouraging nodes to stay honest. If a greedy attacker is able to assemble more CPU power than all of the honest nodes, he would have to chain, uh, choose between using it to def defraud people by stealing back his payments or using it to generate new coins. He ought to find it more profitable to play by the rules such such rules that favor him with more new coins than everyone else combined, than to undermine the system and the validity of his own wealth. 7. Reclaiming Disk Space Once the latest transaction in a coin is buried under enough blocks, the spent transactions before it can be discarded to save disk space. To facilitate this without breaking the block's hash, Transactions are hashed in a Merkle tree with only the root included in the block's hash. Old blocks can then be compacted by stubbing off branches of the tree. The interior hashes do not need to be stored. A block header with no transactions would be about 80 bytes. If we suppose blocks are generated every 10 minutes, 
80 bytes times 6 times 24 times 365 equals 4.2 megabytes per year. With computer systems typically selling with 2 gigabytes of RAM as of 2008 and Moore's Law predicting current growth of 1.2 gigabytes every year, storage should not be a problem even if block headers must be kept in memory. 8. Simplified Payment Verification It is possible to verify payments without running a full network node. A user only needs to keep a copy of the block headers of the longest proof-of-work chain, which he can get by querying the network nodes until he's convinced he has the longest chain and obtain the Merkle branch linking the transaction to the block it's time stamped in. He can't check the transaction for himself, but by linking it to a place in the chain, he can see a network node has accepted it and blocks added after it confirm the network has accepted it. As such, the verification is reliable as long as honest nodes control the network, but is more vulnerable if the network is overpowered by an attacker. While network nodes can verify transactions for themselves, the simplified method can be fooled by an attacker's fabricated transactions for as long as the attacker ha can continue to overpower the network. One strategy to protect against this would be to accept alerts from network nodes when they detect an invalid block prompting the user's software to download the full block and alerted transactions to confirm the inconsistency. Businesses that receive frequent payments will probably still want to run their own nodes for more independent security and quicker verification. 9. Combining and Splitting Value Although it would be possible to handle coins individually, it would be unwieldy to make a separate transaction for every cent in a transfer. To allow value to be split and combined, transactions contain multiple inputs and outputs. Normally, there will either be a single input from a larger previous transaction or multiple inputs combining smaller amounts and at most two outputs one for the payment, and one returning the change, if any, back to the sender. It should be noted that fan, out, that fan out where a transaction depends on several transactions and those transactions depend on many more is not a problem here. There is never the need to extract a complete standalone copy of a transaction's history. 10. Privacy the traditional banking model achieves a level of privacy by limiting access to information to the parties involved and the trusted third party. The necessity to announce all transactions publicly precludes this method, but privacy can still be maintained by breaking the flow of information in another place, by keeping public, public keys anonymous. The public can see that someone is sending an amount to someone else, but without information linking the transaction to anyone. This is similar to the level of information released by stock exchanges where the time and size of individual trades and the t I'm sorry, the, the time and size of individual trades, the quote tape is made public but without telling who the parties were. As an additional firewall, a new key pair should be used for each transaction to keep them from being linked to a common owner. Some linking is still unavoidable with multiple input transactions, which necessarily revealed that their inputs were owned by the same owner. The risk is that if the owner of, the key, of a key is revealed, linking could reveal other transactions that belonged to the same owner. 11. Calculations And yeah. 
Calculations. We consider the scenario of an attacker trying to generate an alternate chain faster than the honest chain. Even if this is accomplished, it does not throw the system open, open to arbitrary changes such as creating value out of thin air or taking money that never belonged to the attacker. Nodes are not going to accept an invalid transaction as payment and honest nodes will never accept a block containing them. An attacker can only try to change one of his trans one of his own transactions to take back money he recently spent. The race between the honest chain and the attacker chain must be characterized as a binomial random walk. The success event is the on I'm sorry is the honest chain being extended by one block, increasing its lead by plus one. The failure event is the attacker's chain being extended extended by one block, reducing the gap by minus one. The probability of an attacker catching up from a given deficit is analogous to a gambler's ruin problem. Suppose a gambler with unlimited funds starts at a deficit and plays potentially an infinite an infinite number of trials to try to reach break even. We can calculate the probability he ever bre ever reaches break even or that an attacker ever catches up with the on honest chain as follows. And it's uh, Q equals probability of an honest node finds the next block. I'm sorry, P equals that. Q equals the probability the attacker finds the next block. And then the, I guess this is the square root of Z or the square to the Z probability the attacker will ever reach up from um, ever catch up from z blocks behind and i'm not going to read all the math sorry um, given our assumption that p is greater than q the probability drops exponentially as the number of blocks the attacker has to catch up with increases with the odds against him, if he doesn't make any lucky lunge forward early on, his chances become vanishingly small as he falls further behind. We now consider how long the recipient of a new transaction needs to wait before being sufficiently certain that the sender can't change the transaction. We assume the sender is an attacker who wants to make the recipient believe he paid him for a while then switch it, switch it to pay back to himself after some time has passed. The receiver will be alerted when that happens, but the sender hopes it will be too late. The receiver generates a new key pair and gives the public key to the, to the sender shortly before, the, before signing. This prevents the sender from preparing a chain of blocks ahead of time by working on it continuously until he is lucky enough to get far enough ahead then executing the transaction at that moment. Once the transaction is sent, the dishonest sender starts working in secret on a parallel chain containing an alternate version of his transaction. The recipient waits until the transaction has been added to a block and Z blocks have been linked after it. He doesn't know the exact amount of progress the attacker has made, but assuming the honest blocks took the average expected time per block, the attacker's potential progress will be a Poisson distribution with the expected value and I'm not going to read it. To get the probability the attacker could still catch up now, we multiply the Poisson density for, you know what, I'm just going to copy that really quick and, and just Google it. Because, you know, I, I feel like I'm, I'm robbing you of something by doing that. Um, yeah, it doesn't work. Oh well, we'll just kind of skip, 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 skip. Yeah, because we, for our expectation on this show, the the mass was not entirely necessary. And yeah, and so we're down to conclusion. 
We have proposed a system for electronic transactions without relying on trust. We started with the usual framework of coins made from digital signatures, which provides the provides strong control of ownership, but it is incomplete without a way to prevent double spending. To solve this, we propose a peer-to-peer -peer network using proof of work to record a public history of transactions that quickly becomes computationally impractical for an attacker to change if honest nodes control the majority of CPU power. The network is robust in its unstructured simplicity. Nodes work all at once with little coordination. They do not need to be identified since messages are not routed to any particular place and only need to be delivered on a best effort basis. Nodes can leave and rejoin the network at will, accepting the proof of work chain as proof of what happened while they were gone. They vote with their CPU power, expressing their acceptance of valid blocks by working on extending them and rejecting invalid blocks by refusing to work on them. Any needed rules and incentives can be enforced with this consensus mechanism. And there we have it. That was the conclusion of the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper, the fourth live reading on the show. And like I said, one of these days, I, I don't like go to a math instructor. I'm like, all right, dude, I want you to break this thing down to me so I can put it in a few paragraph forms. And when I read it, people won't be shaking their heads, screaming, going, oh my God, he's fucking up the math. Because ah! that's not really what I want out of this show. I want people to like listen to it and go, oh yeah, that's exactly how it's supposed to work. That would work just like that. You know what? That's what I'm trying to get here. But now let's, let's, take a step back now that we've read the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper for the fourth time on this show did you hear anything in there about segregating the witness data so that it could be handled by lightning networks off chain I, I didn't hear a fucking word about that so to me that kind of thing isn't bitcoin if you want to do that thing you know, the, it, Bitcoin is open source. You can download the, the source code for it, add all the, all the little BIPs that you want to it, and release the thing. Say, hey, these are the BIPs I support on top of the base code for Bitcoin. If you would like to do all of the neat things that SegWit and Lightning Network and second level payment channel business can, can do for you, please come use my coin. And if it's popular, and if it's something that people want to do, they will come do that. You know? Keep it optional. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down into some music. Now that we have gotten over that, I, I've just, I've been feeling it in the back of my head. You know, I've been, I've been talking to so many people about Bitcoin that really don't seem to understand what they're doing in the crypto space, don't have any slightest fucking clue about the, how this shit is supposed to run and what this project was actually set forth to achieve. And they talk shit to me like like I, I haven't been here for fucking eight years. It's kind of pathetic. It really pisses me off sometimes. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw down some Meshuga, a little bit of Stenga. Here on Coin Metal. And that was God's Law in the Devil's Land. And you won't find Satoshi Nakamoto in a bank. Sorry, two are just kind of incompatible. Anywho. I did have some other stuff I wanted to talk about today. And, um, you know, this one, oh, that was the big fucking whip de doo that I wanted to talk about. There, there's a bunch of buttholes talking about regulation in, in cryptocurrencies. And, uh, the, I guess the one that got my, uh, attention the most was India. 
I guess some dude was saying in, in India that, uh, that Bitcoin was somehow imperiled or needed to be in regulated and shit, or I, uh, I don't know, let's try the news here. But anyway, I, I had a whole bunch of fucking tabs, and then I had, I did kind of like a, a system douching, and I lost my tabs, man, I lost my tabs. Oh, by the way, um, that has got to be like one of the funniest things that I've seen in a while. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's on my Twitter feed. Um, somebody had made a, uh, a parody of Adam Back. Um, he was giving a, some sort of talk about tabs <laughs> or, or, you know, some, something to do with lightning network. And, uh, I, I think that something is really lost on the, on the people that are, that are, uh, championing the lightning network business. It's like this. When, when I do a Bitcoin transaction, I send it right to the blockchain you know, it gets it gets included into the blockchain or it does not. I get a notification when it does. Now, what you're proposing is that I do two transactions where I only needed to do one. And the purpose of doing two transactions will be to forward my funds so that I can spend them before the, the 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 last transaction and and it can be open for as, as long as I want and all that but so like I don't know I'm kind of I'm kind of weirded out on the whole thing I mean like it, it it's probably really really neat and really highly techy and stuff but the the fact of the matter is is that I feel like it's a an effort to push people out of Bitcoin, and I um, or not not out of Bitcoin, but out of using it on chain, because I imagine that whoever the people that are going to be doing these off chain transactions, because they're away from the proof of work, because they're away from the mechanism that makes Bitcoin trustless, they're assuming trust. There's there's a trust involved. And I I don't trust it. I mean that that's I, I didn't I didn't get in this space so that I could trust somebody with my funds. I got in this space so that if you wanted some money and I wanted what you had and you were in India and I'm here in America, I could link up with you online, you could send me the thing and I can pay you directly online. I don't need a bank. I don't need an escrow holder. I don't, no, no, no. You don't need that either. All you need is my public address, and and I, you know, and all I need is your public address, and I, I send the funds. You can check my public address and see that the funds have left, and you can see your uh, you check your public address, and you can find out that the transaction is now pending until the first confirmation. That's how Bitcoin is supposed to work. You know, this whole, oh, I got to send a transaction so that I can do a whole bunch of transactions on the payment channel and then do an ending transaction. And there's going to be all these mystery nodes out there that are supposedly going to be paying my transaction fees or upfronting the money or being the hub that receives all the transactions on the payment channel before the broadcast out to the Bitcoin network or you know a whole bunch of fucking question marks and and please do yourselves the favor read the material watch the videos if you're paying attention you will hear what I'm talking about I'm not just making shit up and fudding about this when the guy that's presenting points to a model on the screen that they made a slide for in their in their what what is it not Outlook what's that shit um, anyway the Microsoft program that you can do presentations with I can't remember the name of it anyway on on that they made a slide. And the guy points at it and says, it would be really nice if Bob was just really rich, 
and he put forward the transaction and let let the let Alice send send some money to Carol by you know sending some money to him and that kind of fills in the money that he already sent and uh, and he's talking about a, a banking model right now you know except where instead of <clears throat> instead of only being able to receive payments from both Carol and me or Carol and Alice he's also forwarding transactions from Alice to Carol Big whoop de doo the, This is so innovative. You know, I can do all of that without him right now. Why would I want to alter the model so that I need him again? Or a him? You know, the, there's all this language that's thrown about with, with these presentations and, and all this paperwork. You know, they always, they always talk about attributes that the, the network can do and things that can be... And, and there's always this implication that, that you, you, guy, guys sitting on the other side of the monitor here, you, or the device, you know, you, you're going to be the one that's doing this. And, but the thing is, is that maybe that's not true. And they don't use, you know, your name specifically. They... They just use really innocuous language that gives you the impression that, gosh, it can apply to anybody. And because Bitcoin can pretty much apply to any, anybody, I mean, most functions within Bitcoin, you know, you could still be a miner. You could still be a node. <clears throat> you could still be a vendor using Bitcoin. But... The, the, and by the way, the the biggest users of Bitcoin are miners. So you know that these there aren't any like legal definitions that keep you from participating in that. But as I've noted multiple times on the show, and as a matter of fact, I have read the legislation. If you go back to my YouTube channel and you check out um, what is it? Uh, the final um, FinCEN drives the first coffin nail or some shit like that. That's the title of it. Um, that episode, I talked, I, I read FinCEN's first report about Bitcoin in this in cryptocurrencies, and this was back in 2013. And I, I want to say that Ben Lo, Ben Flosky was already involved in the in the whole um, Bitcoin Foundation at that point. And um, but like even back then, I think I read it back then. And I think I might have even done a live read of it on this show before then, once t once before. But the point being is I, I read it on that show, and it does have, specifically in it, the description of participating in transmitting of payments. If it's happening off-chain, you are participating in transmitting payments. If And let me say that again. If it is happening off chain, you're participating in transmitting payments because you have to transmit your payments back onto the chain. You see how that works? In the traditional Bitcoin transaction, you could be considered a money transmitter except FinCEN goes specifically out of their way to say that you that is not the case that a quote unquote end user somebody spending bitcoin or other cryptocurrency or somebody receiving bitcoin or cryptocurrency for a good or service is not a quote unquote money transmitter and i mean i i even listened to it today just to check and verify as a matter of fact i think i sent the link to somebody with with that point and and again i'm not making this shit up this is already language that is in legislation and in statements by federal and state departments that they intend to enforce at some point or another or intend to use as defining documents for situations, court cases, so on and so forth, regulation in the future. That's why they do those documents. That's why they make public statements. 
those are the things that when you're reading legislation and it gives you a little number that ref that is a referral tag and you click on it and it, it gives you the title for the thing, that's the thing that they're referring to. Is shit like FinCEN's first statement or, or like the IRS's first statement concerning Bitcoin, whether it was a commodity or whether it was money or how it was taxable. And, you know, again, there is legislation on the books for this shit. Washington has very prohibitive legislation concerning the transmission of money. And if you haven't read it, I'm pretty sure, I'm not... I'm not 100% sure, but I think it did pass. And as a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure that's why I read it. Either that or that it was being heavily considered or petitioned for. I'm not 100% sure as far as the status of it. I think it did pass. Um, but the point being that they are way ahead of you on this, this bullshit that you are going to be participating in the transmitting of other people's transactions. In the, in the sense of being off chain and doing it. With mining, it's very, very different. You're, you're not just transmitting, you know, Joe Blow's transactions. You're transmitting everybody's transactions and you're doing it regardless of the size or the volume or where it's com coming from or who it's going to or whatever. All you really care about is A, did they have the funds? B, are the funds valid? That's it. That's it. You know, is it a valid address that it's being sent to? Otherwise, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get spaced. You know, but I, I just I find it disturbing that people would want to move away from that model. I, I find it a very, very secure model, and it's, it's worked for us. It worked for us pretty much flawlessly up until 2015 when this quote-unquote scaling debate started. And I don't even consider it a scaling debate. I consider it an attempted coup. And, and judging from the nature of your transactions out there, you people, it doesn't seem like you're falling for it. I, I can go and I can look right now in, in the resources that are available that, that display this kind of thing and find that the vast majority of you are not using SegWit to transact your monetary value. And this is two years after its availability, so it's not like there's really an excuse for, you know, oh, you're you're brainwashed or whatever. You read the white paper, probably. That was probably something you did. You probably did your fucking homework before you got into this, most of you. If you're listening to this show, you most likely did your fucking homework before you got here. You, you probably read the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper yourself. You probably read white papers of other projects yourself. Probably read a dozen articles, other presentation materials yourself. And that is why you're here. And you know, I, I mean, I guess in that sense, I don't, I don't necessarily consider this show for everybody, but I, I kind of expect that you should be interested in the in these aspects of cryptocurrencies. You should be, if you are at all interested in them, you should be trying to avail yourself of the newfound power that you have. You are wielding the vorpal blade of digital finance. Please, by God, heft it as such. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down into some music. And... I got some Meshuggah playing in the background, but we already did that. And I'm going to start off something a little bit easier. Just a teeny tiny. Beautiful People by Marilyn Manson here on Coin Metal.
And that was Ministry with Punch in the Face. I wanted to keep it short, just in a little little, little music flavor, you know, because that, that was nine pages, you know. Even though a lot of it was math and some of it was diagrams, so, meh. Anyway, civil honor, we'll get back to it. Got to, got to maintain your hydration. Got to do it. It's a necessity. Anyway, here it is. I was talking about a little bit about India, but I, you know, I'm, I'm betwixt because I, I, I actually started on this other thing first, and I read a good part of uh, Ajit Pai's uh, dissent against net neutrality. And uh, the, it was actually authored before net neutrality was put in. And we've seen a lot of the bugaboos that he was talking about in that paper come up. And so, you know, the question is, what do you want to listen to? Do you want to listen to some guy that, like, prognosticated a lot of the issues that we're facing now in the Internet? Or do we want to listen to people that are fear-mongering to maintain the status quo? to maintain those issues that we've seen come up as a result of the imposition of net neutrality rules on internet service providers and other brokers here online. And I I, I gotta say, I honestly honestly I agreed with what Aj, Ajit Pai I guess that's his his name, Ajit Ajit Pai or Pei? Not entirely sure sure on that, but I saw this article just from the title. I knew that I wanted to disseminate it at least partially for myself because it seemed it seemed like uh, it seemed like this guy was kind of calling out, you know. But this is actually old. Gee, Willikers. But this guy was actually um, calling out against net neutrality a while ago, uh, 2014, according to this. Um, but I, I was interested in it from the title, and I'm still interested in it, and so I'm going to read it. And I, I had to look this guy up and see if he, he actually still has this perspective now that we are this far down the road. So here it is. Am I the only techie against net neutrality? And this is by uh, Josh Steimel, and uh, apparently he was a subscriber to this. Um, here we go. If you watch the news, it seems just about everyone is in favor of net neutrality legislation. Despite being a tech-addicted entrepreneur, I am not. No, I am not a paid show for the cable industry. I am no fan of Comcast or any other ISP I've ever had the pleasure of dealing with. The quote-unquote pleasure, by the way. I'm skeptical of large corporations generally and dislike the fact that, this, that in this debate, I appear to be on their side. It's it's the same feeling I've had, dude. Don't don't, don't mistake it for something that you're suffering alone. While I have no problem with net neutrality as a principle or concept, and nor, neither do I, by the way. Oh, where is it? Where, oh, where is it? While I uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? While I have no problem with net neutrality as a principle or concept, I have serious concerns about net neutrality as legislation or public policy. And since a false dichotomy is being per 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 perpetuated by the media in regards to this matter, I feel an obligation to put forth a third point of view. In taking this stand, I realize I may be the only techie, if I can aspire to that label, opposed to net neutrality, and I open myself to accusations of killing the dreams of young entrepreneurs, wrecking free speech, and destroying the internet. Nevertheless, here are three reasons why I'm against net neutrality legislation. Number one. 
I want more compensation or competition. My oh man, <laughs> that was terrible. I want more competition. Proponents of net neutrality say the telecoms have too much power. I agree. Everyone seems to agree that monopolies are bad and competition is good. And just like you, I would like to see more competition. But if monopolies are bad, why should we trust the U.S. government, the largest, most powerful monopoly in the world? We're talking about the same organization that spent an amount equal to Facebook's first six years of operating costs to build a healthcare website that doesn't work. The same organization that can't keep the country's bridges from falling down, and the same organization that spends 320 times what private industry spends to send a rocket into space. Think of an industry that has major problems. Public school, health care, how about higher education, student loans, housing, banking, physical infrastructure, immigration, the space program, the military, the police, or the post office? What do all these industries and or organizations have in common? They are all heavily regulated or controlled by the government. On the other hand, we see that where deregulation has occurred, innovation has bloomed such as with telephony services telephony my apologies telephony services do you think we'd all be walking around with smartphones today if the government still ran the phone system the US government has shown time after time that it is ineffective at managing so much of anything this is by design the founders intentionally created a government that was slow inefficient and plagued by gridlock because they knew the greatest danger to individual freedom came from a government that could move quickly too quickly for the people to react in time to protect themselves if we value our freedom we need government to be slow but if government is slow we shouldn't rely on it to provide us with products and services we want in a timely manner at a high level of quality. The telecoms may be bad, but everything that makes them bad is what government is by definition. Can we put bad and worse together and end up with better? I don't like how much power the telecoms have, but the reason they're big and powerful isn't because there is a lack of government regulation, but because of it. Government regulations are written by large corp large corporations, or large corporate interests, which collude with gov with officials in government. Oftentimes, they're the same entity, just revolving door back and forth. The image of government being full of people on a mission to protect the little guy from predatory corporate behemoths is an illusion fostered by politicians and corporate interests alike. Many, if not most, government regulations are the product of crony capitalism designed to prevent small entrepreneurs from becoming real threats to large corporations. If net neutrality comes to pass, how can we trust it will not be written in a way that will make it harder for new companies to offer internet services? If anything, we're likely to end up with even more beholden, even more beholden to the large telecoms than ever before. Of course, at this point, the politicians will tell us, if they hadn't stepped in, that things would be even worse. If the telecoms were forced, or are forced, to compete in a truly free market. Comcast and Time Warner wouldn't exist 10 years from now. They'll be replaced by options that give us better service at a lower price. Some of these new options may depend on being able to take advantage of the very freedom to charge more for certain types of internet traffic that net neutrality seeks to eliminate. If we want to break up the large telecoms through increased competition, 
we need to eliminate regulations act that, that act as barriers to entry in the space rather than create more of them. <clears throat> Number two, I want more privacy. Free speech cannot exist without privacy, and the U.S. government has been shown to be unworthy of guarding the privacy of its citizens. <laughs> Equifax. Only the latest revelation of many, Greenwald's new book, No Place to Hide, reveals the U.S. government tampers with internet routers during the manufacturing process to aid its spying programs. Is this the organization we trust to take even more control of the internet? Should we believe that under net neutrality the government will trust telecoms to police themselves? The government will need to verify at a technical level whether the telecoms are treating data as they should. Don't be surprised if that means that the government says it needs to be able to install its own hardware and software at critical points to monitor internet traffic. Once installed, can we trust this government or any government to use that access in a benign manner? While privacy and freedom of speech may not be the foremost on your mind today because you like who is running the government right now, remember that government control tends to swing back and forth. How will you feel about the government having increased control of the internet when Republicans own the House and Senate and Jeb Bush is elected president all at the same time? I want more freedom. Quote, If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. James Madison, The Federalist, number 51. Many of us see the U.S. government as a benevolent and all-knowing parent with the best interests of you and me, its children, at heart. I see the government, or the U.S. government, as a dangerous tyrant, influenced by large corporate interests, seeking to control everyone and everything. Perhaps these diverging perspectives on the nature of the U.S. government are what account for a majority of the debate between proponents and opponents of net neutrality. I believe the U.S. government was, I'm sorry, if I believed the U.S. government was omniscient, had only good intentions, and that those intentions would never change, I would be in favor of net neutrality, net neutrality and more. But, it wasn't all that long ago that FDR was looking up U.S. citizens of Japanese ancestry, I'm sorry, locking up U.S. citizens of Japanese ancestry in concentration camps, and Woodrow Wilson was outlawing political dissent. More recently, we've seen the U.S. government fight unjust wars, topple elected democracies, and otherwise interfere in world affairs. We've seen the same government execute its own citizens in violation of Fifth Amendment rights, guaranteed in the U.S. Constitution. Simply put, I don't trust the U.S. government, nor do I trust any other government, even if, quote, my team wins the election. I see any increase in regulation, however, well-intentioned, however beneficial to me today, as leading to less freedom for me and society in the long term. For this reason, those who rose up against SOPA and PIPA, and a few other go and, and I'm sorry, a few years ago, should be equally opposed to net neutrality. What instead? Internet bandwidth is, at least currently, a finite resource and has been has to be allocated somehow. We can let politicians decide, or we can let you and me decide by leaving it up to the free market. If we choose politicians, we will see the internet become another mismanaged public monopoly. 
subject to political whims and increased scrutiny from our friends at the NSA. If we leave it up to the free market, we will, in time, receive more of what we want at a lower price. It may not be a perfect process, but it will be better than the alternative. Free markets deal exceptionally well in the process of creative destruction, economist Joseph Schumpeter, uh, Schumpeter championed as the mode by which society raised, raises its standard of living. Although any progress is not without its impediments and free markets aren't an instant panacea, even U2's Bono embraced the fact entrepreneurial, cap entrepreneurial capitalism does more to eradicate poverty and than foreign aid. Especially in the area of technology, government regulation has little, if any, place. Governments cannot move fast enough to effectively regulate technology companies because by the time they move, the technology has changed and the debate is irrelevant. Does any remember, anyone remember the antitrust cases against Microsoft because of the Internet Explorer browser? The worst services provided by the large tele telecoms are the more incentive there will be for entrepreneurs to create new technologies. Five years from now, a new satellite technology may emerge that makes fiber obsolete and we'll all be getting wireless terabit downloads from space directly to our smartphones anywhere in the world for $5 a month. Unrealistic? Just think what someone would have said to you in 1994 if you tried to explain to them everything you can do today on an iPhone and at what price. Excellent example. Update 6, February, February 6, 2015. Today it was revealed by the FCC Commissioner Ajit, Ajit Pai that proposed net neutrality plan the FCC is considering th uh, I'm sorry it was revealed by the FCC Commissioner Ajit Pai that the proposed net neutrality plan the FCC is considering is 332 pages long it will not be released to the public until after the FCC voted Pai claims this regulation will give quote the FCC the power to micromanage virtually every aspect of how the internet works. Well, there you go. Was he right? It seems to me he was. And it seems to me that a lot of the a lot of the developments we've been seeing in in cryptocurrencies and, and online have been devoted to taking money from people without them wanting you to have it, you know, without wanting to give it to you. And I, I think that's a, a response to an overregulated market. You know, there's all this brain power out there that is being misappropriated. It's being devoted to criminal activities, whereas it could be devoted to making all of our lives better. And it's not because they don't want to make good things for us. It's because we've made making good things for us too fucking expensive, too unnecessarily expensive for them to do it. And I would argue that net neutrality is part of the barrier, or at least one of the barriers, that, that are inhibiting a lot of that brain power from being appropriately distributed into profitable and pr productive products. And I, I think that's very, very unfortunate. You know, that there, there should be such a a desperation to tax every fucking second and transaction to the the eighth decimal place there's there's all this this urge to misappropriate all this wonderful technology that we have all around us 
You know, you got you got tablets that you you can do all kinds of shit. You can watch movies on them. You can talk to people in video all over the fucking planet with it. But rather than trying to more securely, you know, make it more secure or or allow the market to make it more secure. I mean, because really, consider this. Consider. <clears throat> if all of the brain power that was dedicated to things like WannaCry and all of the variants of, of that, um, if all of that brain power and all of that, that capital had been dedicated to making Visa to Bitcoin transactions more secure, if it had been allowed to, because there weren't any regulations that constrained them from doing that. Where do you think we would be at right now? I, I would argue we'd probably all be having this conversation or, or you'd be listening to this on your aircraft radio instead of, instead of on your desktop or on your device. And, and you'd be flying somewhere that you've always wanted to go and you'd be doing it on a solar powered vehicle that has batteries to store while you're in the darkness and it will have been provided to you because you will have made it yourself and there's no regulation to keep you out of the air because well the air is yours it's part of the commons that's that's the kind of future that I see as being necessary you know it's like what kind of motivation would I have to ensure that transactions were more secure for me if I'm just as insured all the way around if it goes bad. Like, so say I design an aircraft that, that like I just described, that you could buy off of me, or at least buy the specs for it off of me and 3D print the fucking thing yourself, right? But say I want 100 bucks for the copy, because you know what? It took me about 500 engineering hours to design the fucking thing and I'd really like some compensation for that and what what motivation do you think I would have to ensure that that, that money got to me I, I'd be, I might be willing to pay a third party arbiter that could do so from me to you very 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 quickly and very 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 cheaply if I were convinced that it worked just as well as any cryptocurrency, and that's that's where I see cryptocurrencies as having had their genesis, is that that desire, that that forward lookingness. You know, this whole uh, wanting to go off chain. It's wanting to maintain monopolies and maintain nested interests. And these nested interests aren't interested in facilitating a future where you could print up your own flying vehicle, solar-powered flying vehicle. But you know what? All the technology for that exists right now. All of it. And if you combine all of the fucking technology around the planet and put it all together, you could have a solar-powered flying vehicle that you could 3D print down to the battery, the controls, all that other business, in the comfort of your own home. The technology for it exists. The ability to make it cheaper than fueling and running your vehicle exists right now. But what holds it back is all of this legislation that we have that subsects the entire economy so much and creates so much regulatory pressure and friction that the average person doesn't get into it. And instead, because you've made it so expensive for them to produce something productive, something that would improve and forward society in, in ways we can't even imagine right now, instead of, instead of doing that, they're dedicating themselves to administrating botnets that they've made out of all of your IOT devices and they're mining Dogecoin and selling them on Bittrex with it. <laughs> they're mining Doge with your house. Why? 
because you kicked them the fuck out of the air with your insecurity about how we're going to get roads. We got to text my neighbor. I got to text my neighbor and I got to text my text some guy I never met on his every transaction so that I can pay for somebody to make the roads. It never fucking occurs to you people that if it's in your interest to have the road there and it is up to you to maintain the road because you use it, you're going to dedicate some fucking time or, or some, some monetary resource to maintaining the fucking road. That's all there is to it. It's worth something to you to have it there. And sure, there's going to be freeloaders. And who gives a fuck? Because the existence of the road, it doesn't just let freeloaders go back and forth. It lets commerce go back and forth. That gets things to and from you. That links you to the rest of the world. You see how that works? It's worth something to you to do it. Now, if you were to break the internet up to where we're all, say, a node on the internet receiving and propagating transactions of, of packets back and forth instead of this whole ISP market w- would it be worth it to you to dedicate some money to you know pumping electricity to the damn thing would it be worth it to you to maybe put up a few solar panels to power it I think it would be because your access would then be global and with the road in front of you FedEx can get to you and pick up and deliver things to you and from you to the rest of the planet from the rest of the planet I think that is worth so much in the 21st century that yes Maybe once, maybe once every two years, you would probably be willing to put up a little tower and, and you know, renew the hardware in it or at least check and verify and make sure everything is, is kosher on it. It's, it's maintaining the signal and all that. And, and you would be willing to dedicate the, the time to learning how it operates because using it would be an integral part of your life. Just like using your cell phone or using your computer is an integral part of your life right now. But that can't happen with the current need for the market to be the way it is. And there are several regulatory borders to that that are... uh, they do nothing but maintain monopolies and keep what I'm talking about from happening. But you know what? I'm one of those people that was predicting cannabis legalization back in the mid-90s. Back when the the likelihood that medical marijuana legislation would pass in a single state was just a fantasy it was something that we dreamed about it was something we talked about on the couch while we were stoned out of our gourds and didn't have anything else going on at the moment <clears throat> but here we are in 2017 with cannabis legal for medicinal purposes and i think like 30 states and legal for recreational purposes and about i want to say it's like over 10 now Um, I I haven't even been counting, but it's happening. It's fucking happening. They made us re-legalize industrial hemp in the worst possible fucking way. It's a recreational drug. And yet it has happened. And these dominoes will continue to fall. I don't think Jeff Sessions, I don't think Donald Trump, I don't think fucking King Kong could do anything to change that at this point. There's just too much money being devoted to it on the on the investment end, and there's too much money being produced by it on the market end. There's hundreds of thousands, if not millions now, of jobs being created by it. 
So, again, you, you want to kick that many people back out of the economy? You, you want to throw them, throw them back to the street? Let, let, them, let them be slinging their hyper-priced weed? And, and you know what? If you do that, that's exactly what you're going to get. You know, I, I saw this map not all that long ago, and it was a, uh, it was a map of the United States. And uh, it also showed parts of other, other parts of the uh, North and the, the Americas, basically. And it was a map displaying all of the places that can, uh, um, Colorado and weed had ended up since legalization. Meaning places where they have busted people with, with pot that could be sourced from growers in Colorado as the or the point of origin, right? <laughs> and <clears throat> there was there was pot going from Can uh, Colorado to Canada, Mexico, uh, all over the United States, including including states that it was legal for both recreational and medicinal purposes. But this was like black market Colorado and weed. Weed that had not been through the whole registry process or all that other bullshit. So what does that tell you? You know, you, you look on the surface of the of the Colorado market for cannabis and you see something that is hiring hundreds, uh, employing hundreds of thousands of people producing tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars worth of tax revenue for the state, producing hundreds of millions if not billions of dollars worth of worth of market activity, economic activity within the state, and yet you still have a burgeoning black market that is supplying most of the rest of the planet with some of its weed. That tells me that the regulatory model that we have for weed is non-functional. But what it also tells me is that there's a greater market for cannabis than anyone is willing to acknowledge. That more people smoke pot than, than anybody is willing to acknowledge. Uh, and it was funny, I, I went to... Um, when, I, when I came up here... At first, I I hadn't smoked anything for fucking years. I mean, I think I'd stopped in like 1990. And I'd had a relatively sober period from 1990 to, I think, 1998. And, uh, you know, during that whole time, I'd been going into all these stores around me. And... I noticed that every single fucking one of them had at least, at least, I would say five flavors of bomber joint papers. And I'm talking like 7-Eleven, fucking Albertsons, you know, Safeway, gas stations. And they, they all got Swisher Sweets in like Eight million flavors, and it never fucking dawned on me that I never saw a butt for a a hand rolled cigarette from one of these these big ass bomber bomber sheets, or or a butt from a uh, a Swisher Sweet anywhere. And I mean, I I smoked cigarettes off and on, so I I encountered plenty of ashtrays. And I think the whole time I, I could count how many times that I ran into a butt for a Swisher Sweet in a public uh, setting, you know, uh, m maybe on one hand in, in an eight year period. And so, you know, my, it never dawned on me to, to wonder, you know, we're. we're we're all, who's buying all these fucking Swisher Sweets? I mean, they're they're fucking everywhere. I know what a Swisher Sweet is. I used to I used to hang out on the Hermosa Pier 
down in Cal- down in California, and that was that was kind of a treat. You know, if you if you did did really well fishing and you you caught a uh, caught a fish you could take to market, got yourself a swisher sweet. Kind of break the monotony of your lucky strikes, filterless. Anyway, <laughs> hey, living raw, man, living raw. Anyway, the the point being, I, I'm familiar with them. You know, the cigarillo, I'm familiar with them. But, you know, it never dawned on me that people were making blunts with the fucking things. You know, it's like... that. But that's, that's a demonstration of your market. Why would you have 8 million flavors of Swisher Sweets if people are not emptying the fucking things and making blunts with them? Especially if you're not running into millions of different flavors of Swisher Sweet packages everywhere and butts from them everywhere because, I mean, you don't have them in every fucking store because nobody is smoking the things, right? You have them because somebody is smoking them. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down into this music. And I got fucking Meshuggah playing in the background again. Man, love Meshuggah. We've already played some, though. So I don't really want to... I don't want to saturate, you know? And, and I, I expect to be diversifying the old catalog here again in the near future. If you do have any suggestions, uh, something that you would have really liked to have heard on the radio when it came out, or even something new that you would love to be hearing on the radio but aren't hearing anywhere else, please... Join us in the Telegram room and provide a recommendation. Go ahead and tag it with my name. I'll see the notification on there. I'll check it out. And uh, if I agree with your assessment that it should be played on this show, I will go ahead and do so. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw down into some Static X. little Ostigo Undead here on Coin Metal.
suspect in a violent home invasion. They are worried that these men may strike again. <laughs> And that was the Ski Mask Way by Body Count. And I do intend to uh, expand my body count. Um, I, I can't tell you how surprised I've been with them. Um, because at, at first I really anticipated that it, I, I really received body count as being kind of like, a, how should I say this? Kind of like a propagandist kind of thing where it wasn't like real metal because, you know, it's got fucking iced tea in it. Why would it be real metal? You got a wrapper in the front of it, right? Well, this this possibility had been opened by a few bands, uh, namely Anthrax, to begin with, uh, a little bit earlier on than, than it actually came out with Body Count. But, nonetheless... They were always bouncing around in the background, and every once in a while, they would get some sort of notoriety for one of their songs. And uh, I gotta say, collectively, all around, I would say that the the latest album is it's pretty fucking tasty. Although I must say that uh, previous releases by this band um, have been no less surprising and 
I, I think, worthy of investment. So, as I said, I am expanding my catalog of body count in my next uh, my next grouping of of albums to be received. I would like to take time to uh, acknowledge one that I, for whatever reason, I can't imagine what it's been. I haven't added to my collection so far, and that's been Nevermore. Apparently, Worrell, um, the lead singer for um, <clears throat> for uh, for Nevermore, has uh, passed on. Uh, I think that was this morning. It's quite unfortunate. I, I always said that Worrell was he he sounded to me a lot like uh, Jeff Tate if Jeff Tate had a third testicle because there were certain aspects of, of Worrell's range that that were out of I, I feel that were out of Jeff Tate's ability but the the style when he would do uh, some of his clean operatic parts uh, were w- was very reminiscent of uh, of Jeff Tate but his range just pfft, not not no real comparison. I, I'm sorry, Jeff. You're an excellent singer, but you're not Laurel. I mean, you might have you might have been a uh, a progenitor, and certainly a um, somebody he he modeled the, his style a little bit after. Um, from what I understand, he did have uh, quite an affinity for Queen's Reich's music and uh, Jeff Tate's style. Uh, nonetheless, I. I th- I kind of feel like the guy kind of exceeded Jeff, but that's just me. Um, but uh, yeah, that's it's another one that wow, that's a, that's a lot of greats that we've lost in in metal over the last couple years. It's kind of it's very unfortunate, really. Anyway, but yeah, with that, I I will I do intend to be adding some. So never more to the playlists. Anyway, I got a uh, got an article here from Bloomberg. Uh, this one's kind of, kind of interesting, and I, I have I actually have two articles about this that I intend to get to if they're not too terribly long. And uh, this one is by uh, Lane Marlow. Um, I I can't tell by the name, but I'm assuming no penis. Uh, this was authored uh, December 13th today, uh, 2017 at 3.27 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. India probes unregulated Bitcoin exchanges after valuations jump. Interest testing. India's income de- Income tax officials are investigating transactions at various illegal Bitcoin exchanges a week after the country's central bank cautioned users of the virtual currency about potential risks. The surveys are being conducted by the Income Tax Department on virtual currency exchanges across the country, including cities of Mumbai, um, Bengaluru, Bengaluru, and Gurgaon and Delhi. Sarabi. My apologies, Sarabi. Uh, spokeswoman for the department said by phone. She declined to say if the visits were to investigate tax evasion or money laundering. Probably both. Bitcoin soared about 17 fold this year as people rush to buy the digital currency in the hope it will become an alternative to gold or traditional money. Virtual currencies do not have a legal status in India and the central bank has cautioned citizens from buying or transacting in them. It said in a December 5th statement that it had not permitted cryptocurrency exchanges from operating in Asia's third largest economy. The survey is for gathering evidence to establish the identity of investors and traders, their transactions and related bank accounts used. Press Trust of India reported earlier today without saying where it got the information from. Read what other central banks are saying about digital currencies here. 
the federal government has set up a panel headed by Economic Affairs Secretary Subhash Chandra Garg to decide on India's stand on virtual currencies, people with knowledge of the matter said on December 12th. Other members of the panel include Securities and Exchange Board of India Chairman A.J. Tiagi and Reserve Bank of India's Deputy Governor B.P. Kunango, the people said, asking not to be identified as the decision was not public. Yeah. <clears throat> so, there we have it. That's Bloomberg's perspective with regard to this. And um, I, I don't get it. You know, they haven't made an official official statement on it, but they're unregulated. And they're, they're supposedly illegal because they're unregulated. I, I find that to be very, very silly. You know, the, uh, the supposition of the two. It's like, is any activity illegal just because it's it doesn't have specific regulation on it. I mean, is breathing illegal if if there's no uh, regulation on it? Is drinking water illegal or eating or defecating or urinating or ejaculating or any of these things? Sweating. Is sweating illegal if there's no regulation on it? What the fuck? I mean, what kind of world are we trying to establish here? Where if there's not any regulation on it, it's potentially illegal. I mean, fuck off with that, man. I mean, that's that that to me seems so inhibitive of potential for innovation in social and economic development that lacks merit on its face. Anyway, I got this other business here from from the area of India concerning Bitcoin. And I wanted to I wanted to cover this one because it's it's got some neat little tags to it. Uh, this is on uh, QZ.com. Buzzkill. Tax authorities have gate crashed India's Bitcoin party. The taxman is knocking on the doors of India's Bitcoin exchanges. Officials are investigating several Bitcoin exchanges across the country, including in Mumbai. Um, blah, 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 blah. And um, New Delhi and the spokesperson for the tax department is basically the same fucking article that we just read. Eh. I wanted to cover this because I thought it was a, a alternative perspective, but mm. eh, fuck it. Let's let's finish it because there's there's a section where it actually sounds like an original article here. Uh, let's scroll back up just a teeny tiny. Soaring Bitcoin prices in recent months have had regulators worried. The price of a Bitcoin, which on November 1st stood around RS, RS 4.5 lock, about 7,070, has skyrocketed to uh, 13.8 lock by December 14th. This has sparked investor interest with several cryptocurrency exchanges seeing their buying volumes double within a month. In turn, the RBI issued a cautionary note once again, reiterating its previous warnings. In the wake of a significant spurt in the valuation of many virtual currencies and rapid growth in initial coin offerings, RBI reiterates the concerns conveyed in earlier press releases it said in a circular issued on December 5th, underlining the potential risks of dealing in such currencies. Meanwhile, India's central government is concerned that these virtual currencies can be used to launder money and commit fraud. It has also set up a panel headed by Economic Affairs Secretary Subhash Chandra Garg, which includes members of the stock market and the banking regulator, to determine India's position on virtual currencies. Yet, in spite of the government's reservations, these currencies have not been clearly deemed illegal in India. Okay, that's, that's a better perspective. 
Repeated attempts by courts to contact officials and various cryptocurrency exchanges, including ZebPay, Coinome, uh, Unocoin, CoinSecure, and Coinex, remained unsuccessful. However, in earlier instances, the Bitcoin exchanges in the country had assured that they have rules and regulations in place to check money laundering or other illegal activities. Quote, no cash or check is accepted. All transactions are routed via online bank transfer to ensure there is a money trail, Vivek Steve Francis, CEO of Coinome, a cryptocurrency trading exchange, told courts late last month. Moreover, we also followed the electric, electronic Know Your Customer procedure and also checked the Eight hair number to ensure that fraudulent transactions are avoided. See that? They're doing their due diligence. Get off their asses. But you know what? This is, again, one of those positions or one of those points where I really think that regulation is actually going to do them less favors than if they had left it the fuck alone. I mean, things like uh, currencies having trouble or exchanges having trouble, we're often notified of these things hours, days, weeks at the latest when these things happen. So it's like, I don't understand where where regulation is really going to benefit us any. I mean, there's always going to be scammers, and the idea that they're there aren't going to be scammers. It's fucking silly. It's fucking silly. Name an industry where there aren't any scammers, both regulated and un- unregulated. Please. I, I, I'd like to know where it is. I doubt it exists. There have been examples of people trying to defraud one another in every industry. Every single one. Without fail. But, the difference is how long the rest of the market has had to react to the notification of being defrauded versus other men, uh, other, other um, markets. And in cryptocurrencies, it's almost instantaneous. When your fucking network goes down, we know. When the transactions aren't going through, we know. So... I, I don't I don't understand what regulation is going to do to change this. I mean the only way I could envision it is is maybe cutting the reporting requirements and, and cutting down some of the transparency of Bitcoin to where it fits within those ideas. I, I could see that as being a, a liability, a threat. And it surprises me that that um, that others don't. But you know, a lot of you guys are really new to this stuff. And I mean, I <clears throat> I, I I wish there was a way to like make people participate in cryptocurrencies for at least a year before they're allowed to author a single fucking blog post or a tweet or an anything conveying their opinion on cryptocurrency. But that would cut back on on new people coming in and seeing stuff that nobody else saw before them. And that happens all the time. That somebody will look at the chart, see an opportunity coming that not a lot of other people are, or maybe they believe in a coin that nobody else has heard of until everybody else has heard of it <laughs> much like what with with what would happen what happened with bitcoin you know we have a name for them they're hodlers they're first adopters they were the people that were doing this shit long before you were involved and you know the first mover advantage it's it's always 
it's always a part of markets and it's not something you're going to regulate away or you're going to stop from happening and you can go ahead and write up your laws and all that other business but what's going to end up happening is by the time the ink is dry on your legislation there'll be a market response to it somebody will find another way to transact and they will encourage others to do so as well and then you're back to square one <clears throat> with uh, with trying to figure out how to put a stranglehold on the new form I mean because Bitcoin didn't always it didn't always exist you know there was a time without it but I don't I don't see that there is going to be a time in our near future without it I, I think that the current little bump in the road has has time contained time contingencies that uh, that need to be met, and if they're not, <clears throat> and certain progress isn't made in in due time to to respond to the issues being faced, sorry, the money will go somewhere else. The interest will go somewhere else. You know, if there comes a time when there is too much regulatory pressure. We're going to see some another way to transact digitally, peer to peer, that isn't dependent on Bitcoin in any way, shape, or form. That's completely free of it, and it will draw interest away from this market again. It's going to happen. Bitcoin didn't happen for no reason. It happened because there were certain market realities. That we're inhibiting participation from too many for too many of us that needed to be overstepped because well they're they're fictitious in nature and they don't really serve us any function but keeping us out of the market. And that being the case, like anything else in nature, <clears throat> if it's not supplying enough enough incentive to maintain adherence to it it's going to dissolve that's how dominant structures dissolve in nature and that's how dominant structures will dissolve within society civilization because we are of nature no matter how far we try to divorce ourselves from it we are and it is with that that I'd like to close out this episode. Hopefully, 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 Friday I'll be getting my ass kicked at jujitsu again before the show. Pray for that being the case. And so, until then, I'd like you all to trade safe. Do your homework! And watch out for your own bunghole, because nobody else is going to do it for you. Let's go ahead and throw it down. Last dance for the evening. Interbeing by Prong here on Coin Metal. Thank you very, very much for listening. I certainly do appreciate the support both uh, here on Twitter and YouTube and Facebook. Also in the IRC and the Telegram channel. Giving a shout out to y'all. Certainly appreciate the support. Y'all have a great evening. Excellent day trading tomorrow. Good night.